Hello, everyone. We are finishing up our discussion about diabetes and talking about the management of our diabetic patients. A lot goes into this. And while this is a a uh, shorter slide deck, you'll probably spend the most time digesting, pausing, looking into some other uh, references that I include here, um, just so you can kind of sink your teeth in a little bit more to some of the complexities here. I think it goes without saying that we know that the non-pharmacologic piece of diabetic management is certainly the backbone of what we're gonna start with with all of our patients. Um, that includes education about diabetes, self-monitoring, and certainly lifestyle modifications to include diet, exercise, and weight loss. From an education standpoint, um, there are diabetic educators that a lot of our um, health systems utilize, and I know community has that. Um, use that is what I would say. Like These folks can sit down and take time with your patients. You can certainly touch on it as the provider, but we all know that we have limited time with each of our patients and um, sometimes don't have the full capacity to spend as much time as we'd like to. So really talking about, you know, how does it feel if you get hypoglycemic and what, some, what symptoms might that look like and what do you do in those situations? Um, talk about, you know, effective um, administration of the medication that they take, you know, maybe some ways to curb side effects that they might be experiencing. Educating them about what the long-term complications are with the disease state. Self-monitoring, we'll get into that a little bit more in the next slide. A lot of that is that home glucose monitor and recording those numbers, bringing that back to their upcoming visits to help you as the provider manage them most effectively. Plus, it does give them some accountability to maybe track how they feel in relation to what their blood sugars are doing, right? So if they're skipping meals and they become hypoglycemic and feel awful, they're gonna recognize that and hopefully not do that again. On the flip side, if they eat a couple pieces of pie and their blood sugar is 500 and they're just you know, dragging and have a terrible headache, um, hopefully that will deter them from doing that again. When it comes to lifestyle modifications, this is also where you might get your colleagues involved from a dietitian standpoint. Um, you know, there's not one specific diet plan out there, you know, for diabetics that's been recommended. I mean, generally we're, for a type two, we're looking at lower carbs and higher protein content. Um, this healthy eating plate has taken the place of the uh, food pyramid that used to be known as, you know, some of the, the standard recommendations, but really getting a good distribution of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, you know, so any of those carbs, making sure they're not processed, um, and then any kind of healthy protein as well. Again, this is hopefully something a dietitian could dig into a little bit more. I also would encourage you to at least recommend some type of monitoring app. Um, we all have, you know, most of us at least have smartphones and some of the apps like the Baratastic app and the MyFitnessPal app are just fantastic to um, allow your patients to track their daily intake of food. That includes all the macros, so how much protein, carbs, uh, calories, et cetera, that they're intaking. This, this is where in conjunction with the dietitian that they could get those parameters set. You know, you can set the parameters that my daily calorie goal is this, my daily protein grams is this. And as they plug in and they can even scan barcodes on packages of food, it will automatically add that into their daily uh, intake and ask how much of that they ate and calculate it all for them. So it's just, it's incredible technology. Love it so much. The other thing I just want to mention about non-pharmacologic management is kind of setting small bite-sized goals initially. If you tell them they need to do all of these things all at once, I need you to lose 50 pounds, quit smoking, start exercising five times a week, and then I'll see you back in a month and you've not done any of that. I'm not sure that's super realistic. So maybe initially set a goal of, okay, let's have you lose 5% of your body weight over the next couple of months. Um, and, you know, maybe you just eliminate the sugar sweetened beverages that you're taking in. That's the only diet change I want you to make here until I see you back in a month. Those, that's going to, that's going to add a layer of buy-in from your patient and trust and understanding. Um, and then when they do come back, recognize that. I just had um, a friend of mine who said she was so proud of herself. She had lost 25 pounds um, between her last visit and the current visit and nothing was said from the provider 
um, you know, we seem to, to be very quick to notice that there's been a weight gain, but we also need to be sure to certainly recognize and acknowledge our patients for hard work that result in positive changes like that. Our goals of treatment need to be specified. You know, we want to bring your blood sugar um, levels down to a acceptable range. And definitely more importantly, we really want to try and prevent or attenuate those chronic complications that develop from diabetes. And they're bad, right? Heart disease, loss of vision, you know, kidney disease, all those things that um, certainly complicate our quality of life. And then managing their other CVD risk factors um, concomitantly is, is important. And, you know, a lot of these, as we talked about, the diabetic patients that come in, they do come in with hypertension and a dyslipidemia profile. It's important for our patients, in addition to us, of course, to know the targets of what we're looking for. Um, I included the ADA guidelines as it relates to A1C, and then preprandial and postprandial glucose. Typically, postprandial, when you think about that, is a two-hour post-meal blood sugar. <clears throat> That's the standard. And you can see that the ACE guidelines are stricter, just in general across the board. So you know, you know, there are some studies that show the lower you know our A1C is, the less likelihood we're going to have. Uh, complications and less severe complications. But remember, there's a fine line between getting them too low where they have hypoglycemic episodes and certainly something that might have to be adjusted in our elderly or more frail patients. <clears throat> I include this here at the bottom just to say that even with the best laid plans and um, our hardest working patients to get to A1C, blood pressure and cholesterol goals, at best, about 19% of our patients can get there, okay? Even when we lighten those goals to make them a little less stringent, so A1C of less than 8%, and the cholesterol non-HDL less than 160 instead of 130, we're about 36%. So it's a, it's a tough gig, um, both from the perspective of the provider and the patient, uh, to really across the board meet those goals, but we're certainly gonna try. Home glucose monitoring is just a, an essential part of diabetic management. We, we need data as providers to help us understand, you know, what's going on during most of their life. They're with us for small, brief episodes of time where we discuss what's been going on. Um, but the buy-in really changes from your patient when they're willing to do their home glucose monitoring. So talk to them about that. Um, you know, how does this food affect their blood sugar? Does that make it go up? Okay, you probably should avoid that food, et cetera. Um, but it was going to help us adjust medications because there are certain meds that we are going to utilize that help more with uh, fasting glucose elevations versus postprandial. If they're having symptoms of, you know, they don't know what's going on, we'll check your blood sugar to see if that's related. Is it super low? Is it super high? Um, and, and we do always have to take into consideration cost. A lot of these, these test strips are expensive. Um, one strip can be, you know, between 50 cents to sometimes 75 cents. And if they're checking their blood sugars a couple times a day, you know, that could add up and certainly in those that have a limited budget. So we want to understand what their coverage looks like for that. These continuous glucose monitors, known as CGM, they have become super popular. You might see folks who have that device kind of stuck on the um, outside of their upper arm, um, especially have become um, almost necessary in patients who have an insulin pump. Um, consider them also in folks who have frequent hypoglycemia, just general poor control, or maybe they have gestational diabetes. You know, for those that you need more frequent, regular monitoring, um, for their blood sugar levels. They're just, they're fantastic. A lot of them will um, transmit the data right to um, a smart device like your phone. This is an example here. So there's a, um, a small um, needle that's subcutaneously placed there on the abdomen where you can have um, that placed. Like I said, you've also probably seen patients have this on their arm, but you can see in this picture down here, it actually directly um, talks to the insulin pump. So for those that have pumps, this is going on in the background automatically. It's incredible. Um, and it has really been a life changer for those that have been insulin dependent. And like I said, others, it, this is not only for those with insulin pumps or on insulin, but that's kind of where it gained its momentum. 
Okay, so this slide is probably the one that we'll spend the most time on here in this presentation, and it is really important um, just because of all of the options that we have. And this is where we often feel overwhelmed going into primary care practice. At least I remember feeling that way. We had a lot less medications back in the day when I started practicing. So remember we talked about the ominous octet with diabetes um, and, and type 2 diabetes specifically is what we're talking about here, where there's a lot of organ systems that are in a state of dysfunction that are contributing to the insulin resistance and to our elevated blood sugar levels that we're seeing. Within this, I, I have the different organ systems here, and it states, you know, where is the um, defect, if you will, that, that causes diabetes um, and, and the state that our patients are in. In blue underneath, you can see the list of medication classes that have a direct impact on that dysfunction, okay? So for instance, you know, it's not to say there are, as you can see, some medicines that have multiple effects that are benefiting um, our type two diabetics um, and many cross over, you know, so, under the pancreas, that beta cell dysfunction, which we know is huge, sulfonylureas help that dysfunction, the GLP-1s, the DPP-4s, so multiple classes, which is why we often use multiple classes of medications to control all this dysfunction going on. So this helps from the pathophysiology aspect to understand, and maybe in simpler terms, you can help your patient understand that you know, because we have so many things going wrong and so many sources of why our blood sugar levels are elevated, this is why we often have to treat them with three to four medications if they're a type two diabetic. So let's go through this list over here on the right, one by one, kind of talk through why we would use that medicine, what are some benefits, what kind of A1C reduction we get, and then maybe why we wouldn't use some of these as well. So starting with the OG metformin, you know, generally, no matter what guidelines that you're looking at, this is where we're going to start, okay? Metformin, it's been around a long time. We know it gets to the core um, issues that we see with our diabetics, um, which is, remember, that insulin resistance piece. Um, and, and it's just a tried and true first-line therapy, okay? The only two folks that you're not going to, not two, only two, situ, not two folks, but two situations you don't want to start here is if someone has end-stage renal disease. So typically if they're less than 30 with their GFR um, or if they're in acute heart failure, those patients, we're not going to start metformin or we know that they have a contraindication like lactic acidosis, okay? It does have a pretty decent A1C reduction, 1% to 2%. Most common side effects are going to be GI tolerability. Because of that, we always want to start metformin at the lower dose, 500 milligrams as a starting dose. We want to give it um, with food, and I just kind of gradually bump them up. So I generally will start the metformin 500 milligrams with dinner, um, and then after a week or two, if they're doing okay with that, I might bump them up to twice a day. Do take it with food. Max dose is 2,000 milligrams. Um, that certainly can increase your rate of GI side effects. Usually it's stomach upset and diarrhea. And I would always choose the extended release version over the immediate release because that's going to lessen those GI effects. Okay. So OG, start here. GLP-1s. Wow. These have been groundbreaking. And I, I am... Sure, you have not been living under a rock and you've seen all the direct-to-consumer commercials on this class of medicines, like with Trulicity and Ozempic here recently. And even they've been really difficult to get lately from the pharmacy because there's a lot of off-label use of these medications because bingo, weight loss. Weight loss is what we often see as a wonderful side effect um, of these medication, of this medication class. So um, the, the other great thing about this class, so GLP-1s, they, when they first came out, Bayetta, I believe Bayetta was the first one in this class. It was a um, daily injection, subcutaneous injection. They've evolved now that now the medicines like Trulicity and Ozempic, they are weekly. Okay, so it's a t still a tiny shot in a pre-filled um, pen, easy to use, but it's just once a week. 
Um, these are mostly subcutaneous. There is one oral GLP-1 available called Rebelsis. Um, and let's, let me take one step back and just talk about how this actually works. So a GLP-1, um, we're trying to mimic more GLP-1 that our body innately already has. So GLP-1 stands for glucocon-like peptides. Um, and we na naturally make this um, in our small intestine. Unfortunately, when we develop insulin resistance, though, our GLP-1 levels go down. And when that happens, a lot of bad things happen. So what we need and have GLP-1 around for is, number one, it helps to slow our gastric emptying. It helps us feel fuller longer, okay? And that helps us stabilize our blood sugar levels by keeping nutrition around. If we, It's been shown that those who have insulin resistance tend to um, really just metabolize food pretty quickly, which is sometimes why you feel very hungry all the time as a diabetic. So this kind of slows that, that down. Um, it also augments insulin release from our pancreas in a very glucose dependent way, meaning it signals our pancreas to release more glucose when, I'm sorry, to release more insulin when our glucose levels are high. So we've had a big glucose load and it's a very dose dependent amount, meaning it's not just oblivious and sends out an endless amount of insulin. It's very responsive to the blood sugar levels. Um, it also suppresses our glucagon levels, which remember our own body produces glucose. Think about when we get in like a DKA state and the liver overproduces glucose um, overnight. It suppresses that process from happening. And one of the other reasons besides just slowing down that gastric transition time frame, it does act centrally on our appetite centers of the brain and makes us feel full. So it's kind of a trick. So those two, you know, with slowing down the transit through the GI tract and having that centrally acting process um, to tell the brain that, no, I'm not hungry. Those are the reasons our patients are losing weight on this medication. One of the, there's a GLP-1 that's now marketed specifically for weight loss called Wagovi. Um, and it's fantastic, but it's really expensive and hardly any insurance companies are paying for it. It's about $1,200 a month. So these meds just in general are not cheap, but if they do have coverage, the Ozempic, Trulicities, those type of medicines should be covered uh, under their plan with a certain copay. Here's the other cool thing about GLP-1s. They are preferred in our patients with either high risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or even established ASCVD. There's been lots of studies to show their true benefit of reducing those risk factors. That's huge, right? Because you think about diabetes, you think about CVD complications kind of hand in hand. So if you can have something on board that you know is going to reduce those risks, why would you not use it? Um, Reduce it, 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 it of all of these has the most robust effect on our A1C up to 2.3%. That's significant. Um, so I would say the only reasons people don't use this would be cost. Um, and then if only the injectables are available, if you have a patient that's just completely, you cannot talk into an injectable, um, that might be a reason. I will, I will tell you the first time they do an injectable, have them do it there in the office, have your nurse work with them. They will be pleasantly surprised that it's not this huge needle, super painful. They'll be like, is that over? And is that it? So it's very well tolerated. Okay, I gave so much love to the GLP-1s. Let's move on to the SGLT-2 inhibitors. Another great class that's uh, one of the more recent classes that has come to market. Um, some of those examples are Invicana, Farsiga, Jardiance. Um, these are a great second line option as well. We'll talk a little bit more about these within the guidelines about why you might choose an SGLT-2 inhibitor over a GLP-1. But really the main reason is if you have a patient with heart failure or chronic kidney disease, this is a great class. It has uh, evidence, studies behind it to show that. And in fact, two of these um, SGLT-2s are actually indicated for chronic kidney disease as well, which is pretty incredible. So Farsiga and Invicana both have indications for chronic kidney disease. And taking that a next step, Farsiga, even if your patient does not have type 2 diabetes and they just purely have chronic kidney disease, it has an indication for that solely. Um, so Farsiga is typically my go-to just from a, if I'm going to use this class, 
um, it, it has the most data about kidney protection as well. Um, uh, Invicana and Jardiance, um, you know, I, I do use those too. And sometimes, unfortunately, it is going to be driven by their insurance plans and preferred status. So just know your patient. Know all of them are great options for reducing your blood sugar. But if you do want to tap into any of these to help uh, mitigate some of their other chronic disease states, such as heart failure, chronic uh, kidney disease, awesome choice. Um, reduces A1C by not quite as robust as the GLP-1s, um, up to 1%. A couple um, tales of caution here. It does have a diuretic effect. So these really work by pulling blood sugar, uh, sugar from your bloodstream into your urine. So you're excreting sometimes up to 50 to 100 grams of glucose in your urine every day. That pulls water with it. So um, patients are sometimes urinating more frequently, usually. Um, but with that, when it's pulling that urine, it's pretty heavily concentrated with glucose, and that increases risk of um, yeast infections and bacteria in that urinary tract, which can increase infections, UTIs, um, yeast infections, that type of thing. So you really want to counsel your patients about that potential side effect. One way to mitigate that is by having them drink a lot of water to keep that urine as dilute as possible. But even with that, some patients still have these side effects. So you do need to monitor that closely. Um, sometimes I've had to take patients off of it for those reasons. Okay. Um, DPP-4s, these are great options for, I love these in my elderly patients. They're very safe across the board. Um, less robust A1C uh, reduction, but they work, you know, flipping to the physiologic standpoint, the way that these medications work. So DPP-4, is an enzyme that our body produces that breaks down our own GLP-1. And remember, we want lots of GLP-1. We've already heard of all the benefits up above that I talked about that. So we want to inhibit these DPP-4 enzymes because by nature, they break down GLP-1, right? So we're going to try and inhibit that and hence up our GLP-1 levels. Now, of course, it's not going to be as robust as if, as if we're giving them a GLP-1, as we mentioned above, but it is a nice adjunct to some of the other medications that we could use. And you could, I guess you could technically even use those together. I don't use that combination very, very often together, um, but you certainly could. And they do tend to have a great effect if, if you have that patient who's being really good about checking their home blood sugars and they notice, gosh, my postprandial blood sugars, that's my problem. This might be a good adjunct for them. Moving on to sulfonylureas, um, this class has been around a really long time. Because of that, they're really cheap. Um, the problem, there's a couple problems. There's not, um, other than lowering their blood sugars, it really doesn't seem to have an effect of reducing any other complications in your patients, and in fact can cause side effects, the major one being hypoglycemia. And the challenge with that is that these are the class, and insulin included, that if you give you know, high levels or, and sometimes even low doses of the sulfonylureas, it can prolong that, the medicine sticks around for a long time, and the effects of the hypoglycemia can also stick around for a long time. So I made, if you are gonna to have to use the sulfonylurea, and, and often the reason you're gonna do that is because it's cheap and that's all they can afford. I would say that's the main reason. Um, glipizide or glimepiride are the two that I'd recommend. Make this note, you need to avoid gliburide, so G-L-Y-B-U-R-I-D-E. Its metabolites stay active for a really long time, and so the hypoglycemia can be very significant. Hypoglycemia is the last thing we want to deal with, in our, especially our elderly patients, because we know that can increase rates of falls, confusion, and other bad events from happening. So again, this is kind of a last resort. I put it up here because you're still going to see it, but certainly there would have to be unique reasons that you would choose this over the other ones that I mentioned above. Um, and then TZDs, um, Avandia and Actos, those have been around for, for a while. Um, they have decent A1C reduction. There is a black box warning though for this class for anyone with class three heart failure, class three or four heart failure, um, edema and coronary artery disease. Because of that, and we know our population of patients with diabetes that we treat that already sometimes have some cardiovascular disease, I just tend to avoid these. Again, unless it's the only thing that they can tolerate, um, maybe the only thing that's covered in their plan, but that would be a really rare situation again. 
before I flip from this very long slide, um, I did want to mention that um, I didn't include every single drug that we've ever had known to man for type 2 diabetes. So there's some classes like the alpha glucosidase inhibitors like acarbose, the amylin analogs like simlin, and the megalitonides like prandin. They just generally aren't used a ton. Um, and because of that, we have so many other options. I did not include those, but certainly know that there are a few out there that are not discussed in detail here. This is a chart, um, again, busy, um, but maybe just hopefully a, a quick reference to look at the mechanism of action for the different classes of drugs that we're going to be commonly using, uh, which ones are more likely to cause hypoglycemia, um, and, you know, of this class of the ones we actually still use, insulin, of course, and then the sulfonylureas. Um, I also like looking at this because it's a nice reminder that when we use combination drugs, um, we, we kind of are reminded of their different mechanisms of action and why they work so wonderfully in conjunction with one another. So for instance, using metformin, you know, that decreases the hepatic gluconeogenesis or that liver's producing RNA glucose. And let's say we combine that with a DPP-4. Um, so an example drug would be Janumet. There's actually combination drugs that have two different uh, type 2 diabetic medicines in one, and that's also increasing the insulin secretion. So we can get at it from a different, a few different ways, hopefully combine medications that from a pill burden, they're only taking one pill instead of two different pills a day. It's just some really, really good option. Another example is Zigduo, which is a combined SGLT2 inhibitor with metformin. So again, when we can kind of work in conjunction, hitting the uh, pathology from different approaches, we're going to get usually better success and hopefully good tolerability. Um, this one, I just, this is going to be some homework um, that I want you to, to take a look at, especially before we have our synchronous discussion on diabetes. Um, this first, if you can't open it from the PDF, um, you certainly, I, I posted it on the main chart on the uh, endocrinology module page on Canvas, so you can open it from there um, if you have trouble here. But it's just a brief table of the different medications, dosages, and duration of action for the drugs. And then this next one is from Dr. Tui. He's a pharmacist here at Butler, um, and um, it really goes into depth looking at each class of type 2 diabetic medicines. When you use it, what, is the, what are those GFR um kind of restrictions if they have a GFR less than 45, you know, if we shouldn't use a certain class of medication, definite adverse events, um, some side effects to think about, and certainly benefits as well. So you might take some time looking through that. Really the ones highlighted in green are the classes that I really want you to focus on. Um, the ones in yellow, yeah, we still use those a little bit. And the ones in red, we just really aren't using those hardly at all. Um, so really focus on the green, you know, kind of highlighted classes of drugs. And this is just a flow sheet over here, um, you know, to the right. Again, just kind of getting your thoughts together as you're approaching that type 2 diabetic um, and, and what you start with. Um, we'll, we'll talk about a few other algorithms. But, you know, weight loss exercise, always the standard. Add metformin. You know, when we recheck their A1C, about three months, we might need to add another medicine at that point, maybe check them again in three months and kind of so on and so forth. Then there's, you know, down here, we there's there's a lot of different factors to consider when we're talking about therapy. Um, you know, what is their, what are their comorbidities, right? What, um, what kind of end results are we looking for? Um, do they have cardiovascular disease? Do they have kidney disease? Which unfortunately, a lot of our diabetics do. Um, level of efficacy, you know, how potent do we need to get, you know, these, these, these sugars down. So as I mentioned, DPP-4 inhibitors are not going to be as aggressive as like an SGLT2 or a GLP-1. What's their hypoglycemic risk? If they're at high risk for this, we really want to try and avoid SUs and insulins. Um, are we looking for weight loss, right? If that's the case, we're really wanting to think about GLP-1s and SGLT2 inhibitors. Um, looking at those side effects, if they have a history of certain you know, problems in their medical history, like fluid retention, 
Um, potentially, if they have a lot of GI issues going on, typically with nausea and vomiting, we're not going to want to give them a GLP-1 because nausea and vomiting can be the number one um, side effect. And certainly, cost is always a factor with our patients. You know, at times you wish that wouldn't factor in, but it, it does, and it should, and that should be an active conversation you have with your patient because certainly it could affect compliance. So just take some time with this, pause, look at these handouts, um, you know, and I think, like I said, that'll really help you coming into our synchronous event. This is a new drug that's come in the market in the last year called Bonjaro. Um, so it's the first in class. And um, it's, so, it's so new, it's not really even been added into some of the standardized recommendations of drug therapy yet. But I'm telling you, it is, it, it's another one that's been pretty groundbreaking. So it's referred to as a twin cretin because it combines the GLP-1 and a GIP receptor uh, effect here. So GLP-1 stands for the glucagon-like peptide, and the GIP is the glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide word twist. And over here, you can quickly see this is the normal mechanism of action when we eat a cheeseburger, any food, what should happen. And so GLP-1 and GIP are really um, good. You know, when you think about good and bad, you know, peptides and factors in the body, we want these things because ultimately um, it's going to promote our own insulin secretion. Um, it's going to help stimulate, um, you know, the, the suppressing, not stimulate, but it's going to suppress the glucagon when we eat, so our body's not overly producing that. Um, and as you can see, you know, in this chart, it kind of breaks down what each effect would look like. So this is an injection once weekly, um, decreases A1C by about 2.3%, which is the most robust of any drug we have. And weight loss, I'm telling you folks, has been unbelievable. You know, 25 pounds weight loss has been pretty average. So some more than that, some less than that. Um, you're going to see a lot of the same side effects as you do with your GLP-1s, like nausea, vomiting, potentially. You've got to be cautious about acute pancreatitis. Um, but generally, people are going to be asking for it. Of course, the next question is, how expensive is it? And it's really, really expensive. So I've I've prescribed it, I think, once because I had like a coupon to give a patient. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you're going to have to prove that they've failed other drugs um, even maybe a couple in the class before going to this option. Okay, this is another really good summary. So a couple of our vetted, you know, kind of experts, if you will, in the treatment of diabetes, this first um, algorithm, probably my favorite one when I'm looking at management of my patients is from the ADA. And this was a, this is the last update from 2019. I'll be interested if they add in Munjaro um, into this with their next update. But nonetheless, Starting at the beginning, you know, first-line therapy is always going to be metformin and lifestyle modifications. Duh. We should know that at this point. But what I really, really like about this algorithm is the next thing it asks is, do they already have established ASCVD or chronic kidney disease? That just, that just quickly gets my mind right in thinking about the patient specifically and what I need to use to treat them, okay? If they don't have that, I'm moving on. If they do, however, and they have you know, they could have both. Um, and I would say you're always going to, I think, um, preferentially want to treat or um, address the ASCVD risk factors because we, we know um, MIs and cardiovascular disease are the number one killer of diabetics. Um, so if they do have ASCVD, you're looking at starting them with a GLP-1 or an SGLT-2. Okay, and both of these classes have shown major reductions in cardiovascular events, okay, which is awesome. However, if they have heart failure or chronic kidney disease that predominates, then SGLT2s are going to be really where you're going to want to start. And then it kind of gives some other recommendations marching down here about what you should use, what you shouldn't use. And then you can always add on from there. Back up here, if they do not have that established ASCVD or CKD, um, then you can really look at, again, specifically what you're trying to get to with this patient. If you know they're elderly, they're frail, they've been just kind of very sensitive to hypoglycemia in the past, um, we have some recommendations here across the board about what you might try. And again, you march down with some additional options as you add on. 
And then let's say you need to minimize weight gain or really help them with weight loss. We know that GLP-1s or SGLT-2s are going to be where to go. And then talks again about if we continue to be above target, what to add on and why moving down. And then the last category over here is cost. Certainly the um, that is something like I mentioned to consider. Um, unfortunately, these drugs, we know side effects can be uh, challenging. Obviously, if someone has heart failure, you're going to need to avoid a TZD. Um, and again, you know, at the end of the day, hopefully you can still be your patient's advocate to try and get them maybe a, a better drug that, that, that they need, um, but certainly try and be their advocate from that, from that standpoint. This is the 2019 ACE guidelines. So this is from our endocrinology friends. Um, looks a bit simpler. Um, so certainly this is an option to, to go with. They kind of break it down based on what their A1C numbers are. This is why I like the ADA guidelines on the previous slide better because it's more patient centric, if you will, um, versus just numbers. So for these, you know, obviously if the A1C is six and a half percent or below, you want to just, you know, continue to encourage um, lifestyle modifications. <clears throat> and then if their entry A1C is less than 7.5%, you're thinking monotherapy, you know, metformin is your first go-to. Um, you can consider some of the other drugs for additional reasons. However, if their A1C is 7.5% or higher, you're already thinking about dual therapy. That's where maybe some of these metformin plus an SGLT2, for instance, would be a great idea. I'll tell you on a side note, as a, as a provider, I always will generally start with a, a metformin solo just to make sure they tolerate that okay. Um, and then if their A1C is not getting to goal, I might up that metformin or add a dual agent at a three or six month follow-up. It's just kind of generally how I personally approach these patients. There's another category over here where the A1C is greater than 9%. Um, so <clears throat> per the ACE guidelines, they're recommending if they have no symptoms, just start them on dual or triple therapy, as mentioned to the left. But if they're symptomatic with, you know, polyuria, polydipsia, things like that, you might even go right to insulin. I will say I probably rarely do this, to be honest with you. That's a big jump from them being on no therapy for diabetes to going on insulin. And I'll generally want to give them that opportunity to do some lifestyle modifications, maybe put them on metformin. Obviously, I'm going to see them back quickly um, and regularly until we get them at goal, but nonetheless, completely individualized de decision, and you wouldn't be wrong to go there. Nice. Insulin management, beast of its own, right? So I will say in primary care, it's pretty unlikely you'll be doing a lot of this heavily. But if you happen to be in a practice where you are, I would suggest you get further training in insulin management. Uh, and certainly if you're going to do pumps, I have a couple colleagues, um, PAs that work in internal medicine offices, and they do a lot. They do pretty much all the insulin pump management there. This, again, is just some time to break it down. Really major categories of insulin are the rapid acting, um, things like Novolog, shorter acting like Humulin R, intermediate long acting, and then the ultra long acting. So you've probably heard of medications like Lantus, Tugeo, um, as basal insulins, um, and Levomir. But this chart really kind of is nice because it talks about when it peaks, you know, the duration, um, and then a chart to kind of um, exemplify that as well. And just remember, there are some combination insulins as well that might have a intermediate acting with a short acting or a long acting, you know, with a, a short acting, that type of thing. Um, again, this is really beyond, I think, what you'll probably be doing in primary care, but I wanted to put it out there uh, for awareness. If someone is on insulin, and again, you could have insulin, obviously your type 1s are definitely insulin uh, dependent, and like I said, across the board for the most part, I don't know how um, your particular organization manages that, but they're generally going to be seeing endocrinology. But you certainly could have some type 2s that you initiate insulin with as well. Um, you got to think about their supplies, syringes, needles, and pens. You know, a lot of companies have now developed these pre-filled pens that are so easy to use. Um, needles are so small, um, and it's often very effective um, that it's a multi-use type of pen um, that increases patient compliance significantly versus the old day of drawing it up from the vial into the syringe. Um, injection sites, as you can see in the, I know it's small, but any of the orange circles, so abdomen, thigh, buttock, upper arm, rate of absorption is quickest in the abdomen and slowest in the thigh. Um, you want to make sure that that needle, whether it's a pen or whatever they're using, should be in the skin for five seconds. So they need to count out loud before they pull it out. 
And certainly the absorption can be affected if they've been exercising, if they're super hot or super cold, if they massage that muscle afterwards, it, it can quickly increase the absorption and things like that. So you got to think about all of those things. Insulin pumps, again, beast of their own just for more awareness purpose um, that, you know, this is kind of what an example might look like. There's a catheter inserted, um, you know, through the skin. It's often very comfortable. Patients get used to it. Um, and that insulin is secreted into the fat, you know, cells to be absorbed um, uh, into the bloodstream. So this is really, you know, a, a consideration for, um, I actually have a couple type 2s on it who really just have really difficult to control sugars. Um, but if someone's really motivated and has been on multiple daily injections for at least six months, um, it's, it's often a good option. And, and often insurance is doing a better job of paying for it. Most of these have a baseline kind of basal insulin going all the time um, with some bolus um, kind of scheduled throughout the day based around mealtime activity, and it can be adjusted, of course. Um, so the nice thing is these are often linked to that CGM, so that continuous glucose monitor can talk directly to the insulin pump to modify the flow. So it's just super cool um, as far as technology goes and really has improved the quality of life um, of the type 1 diabetics and rarely in the type 2s who need this, but it, it, it's, a, it's a game changer. Um, it also will give them alerts um, if their blood sugar gets too low or it's too high, it, it can notify them of that as well. You know, insulin, you have to be um, encourage your patients to make sure they're alternating their injection sites um, where they can have loss of tissue. Um, really, that's kind of a subcutaneous immune reaction that can develop usually from the older insulins. Newer ones, we don't usually see that with as much. Um, and then you can have this excess of um, hypertrophied tissue um, that develops um, from repetitive insulin injections and not rotating the site. So it's really important to educate your patients uh, to rotate sites because of that. So typical guidelines for initiation of insulin um, for type 1, usually going to be starting at um, 0.5 to 1 units per kilogram per day and divide that in the doses. Most regimens for type 1s are dosed four times a day. So you think about a basal insulin, then you think about, think about three mealtime um, peaks, much like this graph shows down there. Often conservatively, you're starting a little bit lower, 0.2 to 0.4 for type 1s, but again, that's usually handled with endocrinology, at least initially. For type 2s, um, a reasonable starting dose is really that 0.5 units per kilogram per day, okay? And most patients are going to start with the basal insulin pretty much only. Um, and then you you kind of go from there to see, um, you know, how they're responding, what their A1C is doing, um, what their blood glucose monitoring at home is doing, um, and that type of thing. You, I will point out that... I would say all of our patients who are type 2, this is usually added on top of their current oral regimen. Now, you might subtract a couple of the oral agents if they're on 3 or 4 at that time when you add insulin, but it's very common that you see patients on metformin, you know, maybe plus um, uh, SGLT2, plus their insulin now. Um, so this is usually an add-on um, and usually they're more resistant to exogenous insulin. So meaning that they often require more than a type 1. Type 1s, you give it to them and they're very responsive to it at often low doses. Um, so this is a, another embedded document here um, that you can read up a little bit more about insulin therapy if that is going to be a practice setting that you're going to be in. Um, and just remember that all insulin dosing is really just based on your patient's blood glucose readings. One size does not fit all, right, with this dosing. So it depends on their activity level, you know, obviously what their food consumption looks like. Um, and it, sometimes it's just you just have to keep experimenting. But really the key is, is that those patients need to come in with their blood glucose monitoring to help give you the data you need to effectively manage their treatment. This is where the CGMs can really be effective because it does it for them. And it often will print out a report right on their phone or it will send it right to you as the provider. This is just one example of what an insulin dosing might look like. Um, so you might have this um, long-acting um, Detamir here, six to seven units once daily, and then you might give yourself three bolus injections right before each meal. Okay, so just a couple of examples of what that total, you know, kind of insulin dosage would look like. 
Um, and then certainly you might have to adjust dosing for things like Dawn Phenomenon or Samoji effect. Um, and I kind of explained what those are here um, for. Again, things that if you have a patient with a lot of hypoglycemic events and you put on the CGM for, let's say, you know, three to four days, hopefully you can capture that and then adjust their insulin dosing accordingly um, to some of these kind of rebound um, uh, challenges that they're having with either low or high blood sugars. So I like to include this picture of my, one of my all-time favorite coaches, Brad Stevens, who was a Butler uh, men's basketball coach here before he went to the Boston Celtics in the big league. Um, but really, you are the coach of your patients, right? To know, like, how can I manage your health? How can I coach you in all these different areas to get the best results for you and to really get you feeling better? Um, so it's important um, when you initially see them, a complete history, physical, and labs, um, a foot exam at every regular diabetes visit. Again, orient your nurses, medical assistants to make sure that's a routine part that their shoes and socks are already off by the time you go in the room. They can even do that monofilament test. Um, educate your patients about their home foot care as well, like looking at the bottom of their foot. Sometimes they need assistive devices like a mirror with an extender to kind of look underneath their foot. Or maybe it's their loved one that can help with that. Lifestyle counseling, I choose to touch on a little bit every time. You know, how's your diet going? Tell me about your daily diet. Um, maybe the next time, let's talk about your exercise pattern. So try and do it in snippets and not to overwhelm them that they feel like a complete failure if they're not doing a lot of those things. Um, but it is something to do on a regular. A1C, if, they're, if you're changing things, they're new in the treatment process, not at goal, every three months is a standard that you want to check that. Um, if they're stable, and they have been stable, no medicine changes, um, every six months is very reasonable. At a minimum each year, they need to be getting a dilated retinal exam by our specialist um, in the eye world, uh, a microalbumin in the urine, and fasting lipids and CMP. Obviously, if something in these arenas is abnormal, that could necessitate more frequent monitoring, of course. Don't forget about vaccines. Um, influenza, pneumococcal, per those uh, guidelines, uh, I certainly encourage in the right age groups, um, Shingrix uh, for shingles. And then COVID-19, it'll be interesting to see what standards kind of come forth as far as routine recommendations. We know diabetics are in a high risk for complications associated with COVID-19, so I would assume that will get added um, per CDC recommendations very soon. And then referring out, you know, when do you refer? Uh, you know, for endocrinology, I think, you know, first and foremost, if they're a type 1, they, they need to be under their care, um, at least until they're stabilized. Um, and then sometimes they, they jump back to primary care, but quite often for life, they're managed with endo. I have had some type 2s that I've just kind of exhausted everything that I know to do. They've been on four oral meds. They've been on insulin, and we're still not getting them to goal, and I've done other workup on them. Um, and so sometimes you know, those type 2s I will refer as well. But for the most part, type 2s you can manage in a primary care setting. Um, podiatry, you know, that's not a routine. I would say for um, kind of diabetic shoe wear, uh, if they've had any kind of foot pain, neuropathy, maybe ulcerations, it certainly is not a bad idea to have podiatry involved if needed. Nephrology, if they have any kind of signs of chronic kidney disease, I think the earlier you get them involved, the better. And then beyond that, we know there's other complications that can happen. So certainly take each case um, independently and, and really do what's right and what you feel comfortable as far as ability to manage your patient. Um, I threw this slide on here as well. You know, I wanted to point out that while we have these specific goals based from the ADA and the um, ACE guidelines, our older patients here, we often do not, we're, we're often not as stringent with their goals, okay? Because you have to always balance side effects of like hypoglycemia with what their longevity and expected um, kind of lifespan might be. So there might be conditions like an elderly frail patient that you know, having an A1C of 8% is probably not terrible, right? As long as they're feeling okay, tolerating the medicines okay, and that type of thing. So just wanted to put that out there for some perspective. Um, although I know you're not inpatient, hospitalization of diabetics, um, any kind of illness will increase a patient's blood sugar levels. That's the normal kind of physiology of our um, regulatory hormones that happen. Um, 
we do see more complications. Morbidity and mortality are twice that of our non-diabetics. Um, but usually the best and most effective treatment is insulin for our hospitalized patients. Um, it's safe with heart, kidney, and liver disease um, and easier to adjust as needed. So I wanted to throw that in there as well. Okay, that's my diabetes spiel. I'll look forward to our synchronous activity and certainly don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions at all. I look forward to getting to know all of you. Thanks.